I stand up before God and show proper respect to the high God? Should I bring an armload of offerings, topped off with yearly cards? Would God be impressed with thousands of rams, with buckets and barrels of olive oil? Would he be moved if I sacrificed my firstborn child, my precious baby, to cancel my sin? He's already made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women. It's quite simple, really. Do what is fair and just to your neighbour. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. Or as it says in the NIV, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God.
It's so nice to see you all. After a while, I'm really glad to be back and to gather with you. We have been following uh, meetings on and certainly had this experience being very far away, but it's nothing compared to be again gathering with you here in the hall. So, very nice to be with you and gathering this morning to worship, to celebrate God's blessings, and also to be ready to be exposed to His grace and what He wants to give us for our, as a, a meal for our souls. So, God bless us all this morning and also for you that is following us uh, through the internet. We have started off with a reading from the book of Micah in the Old Testament and just listen to a beautiful, more recent song by Graham Kendrick. Both have reminded us about being compassionate and loving towards others. The song brought to mind so many different situations and so some of the suffering that our world faces today. It talks about our world being God's world and the object of His love and how we want Him to help our love for His world and the people He created to be changed from a spark to a flame. And then it ends in a prayer. Lighten our darkness. Breath on this way until your justice burns brightly again. Until the nations learn of your ways. Seek your salvation and bring you their prayer. So beautiful and inspiring words. words. We are going to be thinking about all of these things this morning. As we are reminded of the work of the Salvation Army around the world in what has been the International Development Week. But we are going to invite you to join in us now as we sing another song. This is much older than the one we have just heard, but it talks about the same salvation, the same salvation that God wants to offer and the changes that He wants to see in our world and in His world as well. We are an army fighting for a glorious King. We will make the world with hallelujahs ring. With victorious voices, we will ever sing their salvation for the world. Song 940 in our songbook. And I'm going to invite you to stand, please, and sing with the band this beautiful song through. Straight through.
And thank you, Rhoda, for your flag. That was wonderful. Really enjoyed that. We need to have more of that. You people down here didn't see all that going on up there. What a shame. That was beautiful. Well, that's a very old Salvation Army song, written, if I'm correctly, where's Gordon? Oh, there he is. I did read it from your notes, Gordon. Written by William Pearson, who was part of the beginning of the Salvation Army. In fact, part of the Christian mission, just like number nine. He wrote various songs about the army and for use in the army. And he talks about an army that is fighting. And as a Salvation Army, we're involved in a war. Now, that is not really a concept that's very appreciated at this point in time, when there's a very serious war that's going on, nearly on our doorstep, and it's affecting so many people, and all of us as well, directly or indirectly, even though we're not officially even part of it. But our war is serious too, and I think this song has some key phrases about what we're fighting for. The song brings out some very important words. It says that we will turn the world from darkness into light. It says that we mean to conquer wrong with righteousness, with justice. It says that we go to battle because we want to save the world. And it says we will show our colours boldly. And we'll come back to that one later on this morning. And our message? Salvation for the world. And as Edgar mentioned, this week has been International Development Week. And the aim of the International Development Week is to shine a spotlight on the important contributions that the Salvation Army is making through its work and its partnerships around the world. It's, important, it's an opportunity, sorry, and it's important to explore, celebrate and support the Salvation Army's work tackling poverty and injustice. So how do all these things fit together? Salvation, justice, poverty, development, do they all go together? Well, as Salvationists, we believe that salvation is for the whole person. Amen. I'm glad you said that. I thought there was going to be a big amen, but there was, they're still processing it. The clocks have changed. It's half term. It's raining. Yeah. So as salvationists, we believe that salvation is for the whole person, not just for the soul. We believe that fullness of life is for now, and not just for when we all get to heaven. And that's very, very important. Because these are some basic beliefs that sometimes we may take for granted. But we shouldn't. We should not think that all Christians automatically believe or think or therefore act as we do. All that we do, all that we put into practice has to do with what we believe. We do not have our community work and we do not come alongside others because it's just good to do so or because we're a registered charity. Those are just the consequences. We do what we do because of what we believe. And what we believe determines what we do and how we do it. So let me give you some examples of what I'm saying. Creation, for example, that creation story that many of you would have learned in Sunday school from a very early age. We believe that God created everything that is and that he created it out of nothing. We believe that he created human beings in his image. We read about that in Genesis 1. Now this has lots of implications and theologians have been studying this for a long time. But I would just like to mention a couple of things about this this morning. Firstly, it means that being created in God's image makes us relational, as he is. But it also, seemingly stating the obvious, means that all human beings, all, are created in his image. Even those where it might be a bit difficult to see that image nowadays. 
Sometimes you may have to look hard to find that image, but it certainly is there. It also means that people are resourceful and creative because they're created in the image of a resourceful and creative God. So how does that affect the way that we do ministry? It means that we treat people with respect and the dignity that they deserve as people created in the image of God. We don't judge ourselves to be better than others. We've just had the privilege of already developing our relationship with the Lord so we know him and others maybe don't yet. And the relationship that we've developed with the Lord is transformational and makes the difference in our lives. But maybe others haven't got there yet. We remind ourselves that people are made in the image of God and therefore they are created and resourceful and capable of finding solutions together. So we don't patronise them, but work with them. Do you see how our beliefs influence our practice? Take another thing. Something that you've always learned about as well, maybe from Sunday school, and even people who aren't Christians will have heard about the Incarnation or the Christmas story, whatever you would like to call it, to bring it to mind. Another important word. We believe that God sent Jesus to this earth to show us who he, God, is and how much he loves us. And this great love is expressed by him dying on the cross for us. John 1.14 tells us in the message translation that Jesus moved into the neighbourhood. He came to be one like us, to live a human life with all its pitfalls and difficulties. He came alongside us, he walked with us, and he served. So how does that affect the way that we do our ministry? Well, it adds on to what we've already mentioned. We walk alongside people. We don't think ourselves superior or better because maybe we've had some more resources or maybe life has offered us more privileges or because people are different to us. We work together and we seek to be like our master, a servant to all. Just another word. I you'll know this one as well. Such a beautiful word that... Even people sometimes are named after it, aren't they? Grace. Another important word that I have chosen this morning. We believe that God's grace is present in all and every situation and in all human relationships. John Wesley reminds us that before we even reach out to people or meet people, God's grace is already there. Can you imagine God's grace being in maybe some of the darkest and hardest places that you have ever seen? Or in some of the images that you see on your TV? God's grace is already there. And Titus 2.11 tells us that it's his grace that brings about salvation. So how does that affect what we do in our ministry? Well... We do well to remember that we are all sinners. Paul puts it perfectly when he says, I am what I am through the grace of God, and it is grace we do not deserve it. So we understand that we're no better than anyone else. So as we live our lives and work for the Lord, we treat people as equals, and we seek those moments in our relationships and our dealings with others when the spark of God's grace shines through. Grace is planted in the hearts of people that are made in the image of God. And the last word that I'd like to share with you this morning, reconciliation. We could mention many others, and many others shape our ministry as we're involved with working with people, but this is the last one I'd like to mention today. God has reconciled us to himself. That means that the relationship between us and God has been restored to what God originally intended it to be. And therefore, we have peace with God because of his love and because of his grace. <coughs> so how does that affect the way we go about our ministry? 
Having put our own relationship right with God, he then gives us the opportunity to help others put their relationship right with God. He's counting on us to tell people that because of Jesus, God is no longer counting people's sin against them. He wants to bring them back into his original plan. And that means that whatever they may do, we don't give up on them. Even when sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back. Or sometimes more steps back than forward. And those who are regular supporters of the well know exactly what that looks like. We continue and we persist because God <coughs> never gives up on anyone. And that is a message of hope. You see, sin came into the world and destroyed God's plan in such a way that all these different parts that you see there that make up you and me, and I've only mentioned a few there just to illustrate, all these different parts that make up us have become disconnected because of sin. But because of his immeasurable love, we have hope. And we know that people can be whole. And that is what the mission is all about, really. Working alongside God as he restores that lost image in people and makes them whole. As he helps people to be all that he always wanted them to be. Whole. So justice and the elimination of poverty that were mentioned are not just social benefits and human rights, but they are part of God's kingdom here on earth. And his kingdom is built wherever he is allowed to take control. And that is why it's a war, because we're building a kingdom. And the fight is against people's will, People's personal desires for power and profit, and their human desires and greed and lust and lack of self-control and many other things that you know about. So as we fight to establish the kingdom, God sends along the way many partners, not all Christian, not all people who know him personally, but partners who God can use in his mission and for his objectives of bringing fullness of life to all. One of our partners is the United Nations that seek to bring about justice and dignity to all human beings. And this partner gives us the opportunity to speak into situations around the world, to stand up for those who can't speak for themselves, to speak out for those who cannot say what they need to say. And so our International Social Justice Commission in New York speaks into that, so that we can work on what we have in common rather than on what divides us. And one of the big projects that we need to mention when we're talking this today about the government is that the, that the UN is involved in at the moment is reaching the Sustainable Development Goals. And these goals <coughs> seek to improve the life of people around the world. So though our mission is far greater than this, because we're in the business of building the kingdom, we can support these goals because we also want people to have fullness of life. Starting in this life. So poverty, eliminating it, gender violence, education, decent work and economic growth, good infrastructure and the reduction of the inequalities we experience in our society are all things that the UN and more so the Salvation Army and the Lord is fighting against around the world. And we just want to be part of that, because that's what he wants to do to bring his kingdom in. We want to turn the darkness into light. We want people to be able to undergo total transformation. We want God's love to be more than a spark. We want it to become a flame, as Graham Kendrick's song mentioned at the beginning of our meeting. So let's see what our territory is doing to help make this happen. Have a look. The International Development Unit in the United Kingdom and Ireland Territory was created in 1997 to work alongside communities around the world to overcome the challenges of poverty and injustice. 
Over the past 25 years, our work has supported projects in more than 60 countries, partnering with Salvation and Army territories to create lasting change. The projects we support fall into six areas of work. We're working through prevention, protection and partnership to tackle human trafficking and support survivors. We're working alongside communities to improve access to drinking water, create effective hygiene facilities and adequate sanitation. We're working with international partners to respond to disasters and emergency situations and to provide immediate support and relief. We're working with farmers to improve harvests, overcome food insecurity and increase resilience to climate change. We're working with women to ensure they have equal access to rights and opportunities and the freedom to flourish. We're working with communities to enhance and utilise individual and collective resources to overcome financial poverty. We also fund projects which support and sustain the church and its infrastructure in our partners in mission territories. Denmark and Greenland, Finland and Estonia, Ghana including Togo, Pakistan and South America East. As a Christian church and charity, the Salvation Army is motivated by the biblical call on our lives to love and serve others. Partnership is central to all that we do, and the way we work is shaped by the UK Territory's values. Boldness, compassion, integrity, mutual accountability, passion and respect. Through all this work, and guided by our partnerships, we are continuing to learn how our working policies and practices can be adapted or dismantled to correct power imbalances and refocus resources for a more equitable future. Our projects look differently from one community to another, as the specific needs as well as skills and resources differ in each context. The purpose across all the projects we support remains the same, to walk alongside communities and work together to overcome poverty and injustice. Now we are going to listen to the message of the songs test, please. And they are going to bring us a song with a quite different style. It's entitled, No One Like Jesus. This is a song which has become very popular in parts of Africa and over here in the UK as well. It's uh, in some various languages. We're going to sing a verse in Sizulu. So if anybody speaks Sizulu fluently, we apologise for the mispronunciation. But we hope that you understand the message of our song this morning. And we are also delighted to have a guest percussionist today in Axia on the spot. So Axia, we're listening to you. Bless you.
today. Thank you, Nancy. some prayer things that we've been asked to pray for that go with our special theme of International Development Week. And they're going to be presented to us, so we're going to do it this way. Each one is going to read to us the reasons for the theme that we're going to pray for. Then we're going to have a time of silent prayer. And then we're going to sing together a chorus which says, O Lord, hear my prayer. O Lord, hear my prayer. When I call, answer me. O oh Lord, hear my prayer. O oh Lord, hear my prayer. Come and listen to me. Very easy chorus. You can join in. Lisa is going to help us. And we're going to think about these different subjects that are so important. We want to pray for people around the world who need our prayers this morning. So Edgar's going to start us off. We want to pray this morning for those suffering because of disastrous events related to natural hazards worldwide, many of them caused by climate change. We think of the over 101 million people that have been affected just in the last year. We think particularly of the recent floods in Pakistan and the hurricanes in the United States. And remember those families this morning. We pray as well for the man-made emergencies that our world faces. And specifically, we pray for Ukraine and the many refugees' families feeling the conflict. We also want to include in our prayers those on the front line of this response that they may have continued strength to carry on as the war is so prolonged. Let us pray.
strengthening links across territories and offering repatriation opportunities to survivors of trafficking. We also want to remember those who are victims of domestic abuse. This is a universal issue, not bound by social status, wealth or gender. However, most victims are female. One in three women around the world experience intimate partner abuse or non-partner sexual violence in their lifetime. Pray for the partnerships the army is working with in Argentina and Bangladesh. Pray that they may have wisdom and sensitivity when speaking about emotional and physical abuse. And pray for family members indirectly impacted by domestic abuse, especially children.
We put all these situations into your hands. They're far bigger than us. But you are a great God. And you are the God that we pray to. So we give them all to you. Amen. Amen. You, those of you who received the core bulletin, when you receive the link to this meeting today, you will also be able to receive these two sheets that will come together with your bulletin. And these prayer subjects and many more things to pray about are on these sheets. So please look up the link that John will send you later on today if you are on the core list. Now, the Salvation Army's international development vision in the UK is for a world without poverty and injustice. And I'm sure all you adults know exactly what that means. But I wonder if the children know what that means. So let's ask the children down here. Let's see if they know. Can anybody tell me, children, what injustice means? Does anybody know? Um, injustice? Go on, let's see. Come here and tell us. I thought you'd know. Never mind. Injustice is when like someone kills someone and then like the police does not care, does not do anything about it. That's injustice because they will leave him die. Yeah. How did he die? Someone killed him. Yeah. Or he died in a natural way. So nobody did anything about it. That's if someone did something about it and the police did not do anything about it, that's injustice. Do you think that's a good definition? Did you hear that up there? Yes, well done. You know. Come on, you, but you're going to have a chance too. You tell us. It's like, what, it's like someone or not being fair to someone. Like, if someone's, like, if someone's being, if something gets something better than you. Yeah. And, and, the, and someone doesn't care and they just don't care if it's not fair. Yeah, that is, oh, well, brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, wonderful. So what I need all of the children to do now is to pick up a chair and come round here to the front and put your chair facing me here. Put your chair here facing me. Come on, Samuel, you need a chair. Come on, put your chair facing me here. There we are, Uziel, you sit there as well. There we are. Everybody's going to come and sit here facing me. And... You said it very well. It's about being fair and unfair. So we're going to play a game which is fair and unfair. Okay? So you people have to do something. And you, so you've got to pay attention so that you know. So that you know what you're doing. We've got one more chair. Have we got anybody else who's not around? I can't see Sam. Where's Sam? Oh, Sam. Come and play, Sam. Come on. Come and play with us. Yes. Because it's all about being fair and unfair talking about justice. So you have to pay attention. Sam's just coming down. He's going to help here, Ari, and I'm sure he's going to be, he's going to know everything and he's going to join you and he's going to know what to do. So the game is like this. I'm going to say something and you have to decide if it's fair or unfair. If it's unfair, you have to stand up. If it's fair, you remain seated. Okay, shall we see? Shall we see if that works? Let's see. You ready? Yeah? Okay, so let's go. So the first one is, you're not allowed to go to school because you need to work. Fair or unfair? Well done. Unfair? Unfair? We stand up, don't we? Well done. Unfair? You can sit down. Well done. Yeah, we don't want to have to work. We want to go to school, don't we? So the next one is, you're asked to clear the table after dinner. Fair or unfair? Ah, <laughs> unfair. Well done. Who's the outstand that stood up for what he believes? It is really fair because everybody has to help at home, don't they? Sometimes. So that's. I would say that's fair, but some people would say it's not very fair. Anyway, the next one. You have. You can't have a toilet break all day long. Is that fair or unfair? Oh, definitely unfair. Ask all the old people in the meeting, they can do that toilet break. Yeah, they need it all the time. 
well done. Sit down. That's wonderful. Now, the next one. You're not allowed to eat burger and chips for every meal. Fair or unfair? <laughs> I thought you would say that. Burger and chips should be all the time. But really, burger and chips all the time doesn't do us too much good, does it? So, let's go on to the next one. You have to walk five miles, five miles is like for over an hour, to collect drinking water and then carry it home. Fair or unfair? Fair or unfair? You have to walk for over an hour and then you have to carry water all the way. Is that fair or is it unfair? We just have taps. We do, don't we, Ellie? Thank you very much. You can sit down. But so many children have to do that. They have to walk and carry water for hours and hours on end because there's no water in their house. And it's not fair. So that is really unjust, injustice. What we call about is what we're talking about, injustice. Next one in, we get at the end. You're asked to pick vegetables from the garden for dinner. Fair or unfair? I don't know. You don't have gardens, do you? Don't need vegetables. You don't know, do you? If it's from the garden, you're okay. It's fair. Mum can send you to the garden to pick up vegetables. That would be okay. Okay. Well, that's fair. Some children have to do that all the time. They have to pick their food before they can eat it. But it's, it's okay going to the garden. You're not allowed to watch television until you've finished your schoolwork. Fair or unfair? No. Unfair. <laughs> Well, that stood up really determined. <laughs> I was thinking twice. Yes, okay. You can, you'll get the detention, yes. You can sit up. Rather not go there, eh? Rather not go there. Okay. You can't drink water all day, even when it's boiling hot day. Fair or unfair? Unfair. As if you're thirsty, you want to drink water, don't you? Okay, sit down, and here is one for our little ones as well. They can do this. You have to share toys with others who also want to play with them. Fair or unfair? You don't want to share your toys. You don't want to share your toys. Oh, she doesn't want to share her toys either. It's good she's got two brothers, isn't it? Because then she doesn't have to share. Okay, thank you very much. So let's go to the next one, the last one now. You, you what? You don't want to show your toys, that's unfair. Okay, that's fine. That's fine, Sophia. You, you made that position clear then. Good. So, sometimes we think it's not fair to have to share, do we? We don't want to share. So, you have to do all the cleaning of the house, cook the meals, and take care of your brothers and sisters on your own. Is that fair or not fair? If you've got them. You have to think if you've got them, though. You haven't got them. Is that fair? No, it's not really very fair, is it? Have to do the cleaning, cook the meals, and take care all on your own. So sadly, you can sit down. Some children have to do a lot of things that are unfair. And in many places in the world, injustice and being fair and not being fair isn't practiced. But today we want to remember that even though that is true in many places, God still has everybody in his hands. So we're going to see the chorus that you know very well. He's got the whole world in his hands. The whole wide world in his hands. And Lisa's going to help us to do that as we sing along. And we're going to invite you to join us as we remember that many children and people around the world don't have a fair or a just mind. But they're still in God's hands and God has his eyes on them. So join us as we sing here together with the children. Thank you, Lee.
for Nancia and Gia and Uziel. We're going to ask you to come here and we're going to invite Walter and Vanessa to come here too at this time. Yeah, come here. We're going to take the chairs away, all the rest of them, and we're going to ask you to come here. Sit, sit, sit. So would you would you like to sit down over there with Harry at this moment? Because we're just going to talk to this beautiful family here. Who have been with us for nearly a year now, but as from tomorrow have been given their new house in South Sea, Portsmouth. So they will be moving. So we want to take this opportunity to wish them so well. So we have a little something for the boys and Charlotte is going to come and bring it and give it to each one of them. So they can each take with them beautiful Bible stories that they can continue to read and so that they don't miss out on anything we have a beautiful Bible for the family as well, in English as you continue to learn English along your way. And we want to pray for them, don't we, as they go. I'm going to invite you to stand and pray with us together with this family. And we're going to pray in Spanish, I hope you don't mind, but that would be so significant for them. And Ed is going to pray with us. Will you excuse us? So let us pray in Spanish. Querido Dios, el Padre Esencial, te alabamos por este momento tan lindo que creemos solo es posible por el sacrificio de tu Hijo amado Jesucristo que trae nosotros juntos para compartir y para ser bendecidos por ti. Y de esta manera, esta familia ha llegado hasta Croydon Citadel para poder eh, recibir cosas que necesitaban en su momento y que tenía que ver con la escuela y cosas muy prácticas al estar llegando en Inglaterra. Pero junto con esto, tú ya estabas proveyendo para ellos uh, tus bendiciones, tu presencia, una comunidad para que ellos pudieran sentirse amados, recibidos, y así que ha pasado un año. Tantas cosas hemos vivido juntos, y te alabamos por esto, y en este momento de manera muy especial, cuando nuestros caminos se separan, por un poco, pero pedimos que eh, tú puedas estar con ellos, y aunque están, vamos a estar distantes, que aún así podamos sentirnos cercanos por tu espíritu, por tu amor, por tu presencia. Pedimos de una manera muy especial que tú puedas seguir los pasos de cada uno de ellos, así como has seguido hasta aquí. Que tu bendición, tu presencia, tu inspiración, tu espíritu pueda conducirlos por esta nueva etapa de sus vidas en Inglaterra. Y que puedan experimentar nuevas bendiciones, exactamente con nuevos desafíos también, pero nuevas bendiciones a tu lado, conociendo otras personas, otras eh, áreas del país y también parte de tu iglesia, allá donde van a vivir. Que una nueva comunidad pueda llegarse a ellos y ellos puedan también conocer y integrarse y ahí sentirse parte de esta familia. Te alabamos, te agradecemos y te pedimos todo esto en el nombre precioso de Jesucristo, nuestro Salvador. Amén. Hecha por una señora de aquí de la iglesia, a beautiful card made by Maggie. We're going to give them to take with them, wishing them well. Una bolsita para poner todas las dos Biblias que van a tener y oremos para que Dios les bendiga. We want to keep them in our thoughts and our prayers, don't we, as they go. We're going to try and link them up with the Salvation Army in South Sea and Portsmouth, where they're going to be. But we pray that the Lord will be with them. So it's so God bless you. Thank you. Please be seated.
It's wonderful to see you all here in worship today. And as we say goodbye to the Ramirez family, it's lovely that they will still be able to follow us online. Um, but we do wish them very well. Please do check and read your email bulletins. Um, there are three notices in today's bulletin that I would like to emphasise to you. Um, many of you will be aware that the Corps has a licence to record and upload music during the meetings. Um, and it is possible for individuals to make a recording on their own devices for personal use. But it is illegal to upload that recording to the internet or Facebook. Graham is too valuable to us to risk losing him to jail for an infringement. So please, don't be illegal. Observe the rules. And yet more internet advice. If you log on to the internet here at the hall, would you please log on as guest and not to the call? The password is available in the bulletin again, or from Sarah, Edgar, John, or myself. On Sundays following the morning meeting um, and coffee, we'll be locking the front door in the foyer for safety reasons once most people have left. Um, should the door be locked when you need to leave, please would you leave um, from the corridor from the community hall and exit through the fire doors there. But please do shut the fire doors after you've gone through, please. And uh, hopefully that will improve the safety of this building. Home League on Wednesday um, will be at 10 o'clock, um, 10 o'clock to start. And this week it's all about controls. Who is controlling you or me? Is it that TV control or not? Anyway, come and find out for the Home League on Wednesday for 10.30. Next Sunday, uh, we are very pleased that Sarah and Edgar are back. And uh, we intend to make them work again for the Saturday this week. They will be leaving some worship next week. On to Advent. Um, the caroling list for volunteers to collect will be available uh, when we have confirmation of when and where we will be from the council. With regards to Christmas cards, um, there will be a facility to make a donation to the core accompanied by one card addressed to all, and these will be displayed in the foyer. You don't have to do this, but it's just there if you prefer to do that. It will help us to raise some funds and also it might be kinder to the environment as well. More details about that scheme and other events will be added as they become available. And back to today. There will be Sunday Night House. Um, the youngsters will go out in a few moments. Refreshments will be in the community hall following the meeting. The weather is looking very dodgy, so I don't think we'll be having an open air, but final confirmation of that will be at the end. And for the flowers today, Lena, we say thank you. She's celebrating the 23rd wedding anniversary, and we see the beauty of it. So thank you, Lena. And we now continue in worship with always one of your offering. Thank you for listening.
if I may be so bold as to offer a few words of encouragement. Um, I like to do things my way, um, but I'm always told I have to do it God's way. So we had a bit of a, an argument recently, and he won. So if you ever feel discouraged or unworthy, or like me often not good enough, remember that you're in good company. Remember these people in the Bible. Moses stuttered, David's armour didn't fit, John Mark was rejected by Paul, Timothy had ulcers, Hosea's wife was a prostitute, Jacob was a liar, David had an affair, Solomon was too rich, Jesus was too poor, Abraham was too old, David was too young, Peter was afraid of death, Lazarus was dead, John was self-righteous, Naomi was a widow, Paul was a murderer, so was Moses, Jonah ran from God, Miriam was a gossip, Gideon and Thomas both doubted, Jeremiah was a depressive, Elijah was burned out, John the Baptist was a loudmouth, Martha was a worrier, her sister may have been lazy, Samson had long hair. <laughs> <laughs> Noah got drunk. And I'm sure there are many others who had a short fuse. But God is not prejudiced. God is not partial. He's not judging. He's not grudging. He's not deaf to our cry. And he's not blind to our need. God is just wonderful. And he's given us his unconditional gift and his unconditional love. And if you don't feel worthy, if you don't feel good enough, trust me and trust God. Let's pray over your offering. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the gifts that we were able to give today. Thank you, Lord, that you give us so much that in these few times, these few moments, we are able to give you a little bit of what we can to give you back. For the glory of your kingdom, we give you our, our money, our tithes, our time, our love, our devotion, and our love for each other. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you give to us, and may you bless this money, and make you multiply it for your kingdom. Amen.
Beautiful. Thank you, Ben. Before we have our Bible reading, I'm going to ask Leo to come and join me here on the platform. Salvationists, how do they support development projects 
What, what sort of things do they do? Uh, I serve as uh, the assistant for project office at the time, and where we identify and develop and also support a projects. Praying would be the immediate support from the service units. Financially, from my opinion, even mainly the development works funded by international sporting offices, but the territory can manage now to fund it, a project, development project from a local fundraising campaign. For me, the standout what Indonesian can do is about the resilience. I can share a story about 2018 earthquake, liquefaction, and tsunami in Palu. There was a core just about to be dedicated in two weeks from 15 years of building. Wow. It's different in 15 years because in Indonesia, we little bit by little collect our fund there. You build it, as you have money to build. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and it took 15 years for this core just to be about to yeah. the yeah. And then earthquake happened, the building collapsed. Two months or three months later, when the government said, yes, green light for this area to be a semi-permanent building for the core building, the congregation raised the fund for a new building. Wow. That's the, that kind of resilience or hard work for mm -hmm. the so they, so they pay, uh, they pray, sorry, they pray, they fundraise, and yeah. they're resilient. That's what the main thing to say, salvation is not there. <laughs> I think he's tense. He's going to have it afterwards when, when all this is over. I think that's what <laughs> And you work at emergency services at IHQ. So, what are the main areas of concern at this time around the world for the emergency services in general? What sort of thing is the. Currently, the human caused disaster in the eastern part of Europe still takes our attention. Especially with the cost of living raising, then the winter and cold weather approaching, and what it means for all the refugees or the affected uh, communities in that part of uh, Europe. However, natural disaster also came along during this time as well. Hurricanes in the Philippines, hurricanes in the US and Caribbean, flooding in Pakistan, India, even in Indonesia. And then Japan uh, hit by earthquake last month. Drought, food really for drought, food really because of drought in Africa, and also peace preparedness in that kind of that part of Africa in Nigeria yeah. territory. Lack of rain, too much rain in some parts, and too not enough rain not in other parts causing drought and famine. Yep. And what we heard this morning, the problem of food security, lack of clean water and all those yep. other things that the UK territory are working on. How many times the Salish army starts to work on emergencies, um, and most of the people who've been in other countries and are here this morning, you would have seen that. But then we stay there so long that we get involved in restructuring the work and it becomes development work from emergencies it evolves, doesn't it, into development work. Can you give us an example of where this has happened and how Salvation Army personnel transition from, from one thing to another, from emergencies to development? Could you? If, yeah, if I can share my experience linking between relief and development and relief rehabilitation and development is when, when I'm still serving in Indonesia, after the 2018 disaster in uh, earthquake in Palu. So the local government identified that one of the immediate needs was access to a clean water and sanitation was project basically. And we in project office uh, supported by international sporting offices, the zonal, supporting us 
financially to build a toilet block. Toilet block consists of four different toilets and also changing room kind of changing room like that. We built it near Salvation Army Hall, Salvation Army School, Seven Army Clinic at that time. And we can give the community, affected communities, access to a clean water and a sanitation, hygiene sanitation. During that time, it works well. And moving forward to the development and rehabilitation and development, nowadays, the communities need to maintain the toilets they're working, the sanitation, and the local government through their local funding, maintain the funding for the maintenance for everything to look after. So the people, the communities can use the toilet blocks. So they've taken ownership of the yes, project that yes. started as an emergency? So from the emergency states become rehabilitation and now moving forward into development. And those sort of things are so important. Something that we take so much for granted, but people in areas especially after right. disaster, they don't have those important places. And especially when we think of girls, um, teenage girls, women, uh, how important those places and are. And also accessible, accessible platform for the toilet as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in your opinion, now it's your opinion, Leo, <laughs> Why is it important for the Salvation Army to be involved in, in this sort of work? I mean, you're involved in it every day. Before you came to IHQ, you were the project officer in Indonesia. Am I right there? You worked in the project as well. Why do you think it's important for the Salvation Army to be involved in this sort of work? Uh, my opinion is, as we serve in 130 plus countries mm -hmm. around the world, will give us a picture of geographical spread of how we could share the love of God and meeting human needs without discrimination. Different cultures, different customs, and different approaches of how we serve our neighbor mm -hmm. in needs, but with the same message about the good news of our Savior. Not necessarily with financial support, but also with personal support, knowledge support, prayer support and any support that we together could do for them. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to what we were saying at the beginning of the meeting, really, about you know, people, people uh, <coughs> being created in God's image and us wanting to help them bring back that dignity and that respect and, and taking the word of salvation to them as well in, in the full sense of it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Leo. I thank hope you enjoy you. your coffee now. You're thank the you. one that's allowed to drink, but the rest have to wait till after the meeting. But you, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing with us about thank you. what happens. And we're going to ask David Rowlands and Eleanor to come now, because they're going to read for us um, some verses from Isaiah. And we're going to ask them if they can stand to thank you, Mia, if you'd like to take your coffee with you. And um, David and Eleanor. Eleanor's going to read first, I believe. We've got a mic from there. And Eleanor, thank you so very much. The reading from the Bible this morning is from Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 to 12. This is the kind of fast day I'm after, to break the chains of injustice, get rid of exploitation in the workplace, free the oppressed, cancel debts. What I'm interested in seeing you do is sharing your food with the hungry, inviting the homeless poor into your homes, putting clothes on the shivering ill-clad, being available to your own families. Do this and the lights will turn on and your lives will turn around at once. Your righteousness will pave your way. The God of glory will secure your passage. Then when you pray, God will answer. You'll call out for help and I'll say, here I am. Practices, quit blaming victims, quit gossiping about other people's sins. If you are generous with the hungry and start giving yourself to the down and out, your lives will begin to glow in the darkness. Your shadowed lives will be bathed in sunlight. I will always show you where to go. I'll give you a full life in the emptiest of places. 
felt muscles, strong bones. You will be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. You will use the old rubble of past lives to build a new, rebuild a foundation from out of your past. You will be known as those who can fix anything, restore old ruins, rebuild and renovate. Make the community livable again. Yes, God says so. Thank you for bringing us that Bible reading from the message. Thank you, Leo, for sharing with us as well. Turning the world from darkness, darkness into light. Changing our love from a spark to a flame. Of course, to do that, you have to have the love of God in your heart to begin with. But supposing that most of us already have that and have been transformed by that wonderful <coughs> love of Jesus, and that we already enjoy a relationship with our loving God, and that we are being made whole day by day as we deepen that relationship with him. As we get to know him more, we allow him to mould and transform and improve and utterly change who we are. If all this is true, and we are re already a work in process, then the question arises, is, what can we do? Seems to be so much. And Paul writes to his dear friend and learner, Timothy, at a time when actually seemed to have a lot in common with our present days. He says in 2 Timothy 4, you're going to find that there will be times when people will have no stomach for solid teaching, but will fill up on spiritual junk food, catchy options that tickle their fancy. And he didn't even know about social media in those days, eh? They'll turn their backs on truth and chase mirages. And in the previous verses, one and two, he mentions the present situation and what God wanted to do. Um, but when we come to verse five, and that's the one I want to focus on, he says something that I believe is important as we leave, as we think about this today. He says to Timothy, but you, Timothy, keep your eye on what you're doing. Accept the hard times along with the good. Keep the message alive and do a thorough job as God's servant. Keep your eye on what you're doing. Keep the message alive. Live out the gospel in season and out of season. Do a thorough job as God's servant. What can we say? We don't always know the consequences of what we are going to say. Look what happened this week to what in our very own Croydon University Hospital. Did you pick up on that? Yeah, I can see the people up there nodding. Did you pick up on that? On our own store doorstep, Catherine Paul, a salvationist from Penge Court. What probably started out for her as a normal day went viral on social media. Do you know her? Yes. Good. I don't know her yet, but I certainly want to meet her after all that she's done. Bless her, when she gets out of hospital. She certainly did a thorough job as God's servant this week. She was given the opportunity to speak to the new Prime Minister himself, and she did not waste it. She spoke out for those that needed it, and she did not take any answer as an answer. And did you see the little finger? You're not doing enough. That's what caught my attention. My mother-in-law used to have a finger like that, and I could just see her there. You're not doing enough. Keep the message alive. All people are made in the image of God and deserve respect, dignity, and justice. Talk about showing our colours boldly that was in our first song. The message we're called to proclaim is a message of full salvation, making people whole. And our reading from Isaiah that we've just had talks about breaking the chains of injustice, getting rid of exploitation in the workplace, there you are, freeing the oppressed, sharing what we have with others, helping those with our homes, putting clothes on the shivering, being available to our own families, giving up unfair practices, quitting blaming victims, stop, goss stop gossiping about what other people have done wrong, start giving ourselves to the down and outs. And what will happen? Well, verse 8 tells us, the lights will turn on in your life. Your life will turn around at once. The love of God will be shown and transformed from a sparkle to a flame. But we need to be willing to do that. For all this to happen, and we don't have to be wonderful people, Anne's reminded that as of that today. The key person is to be want is to want to be used 
by God. And we have a song that mentions just about that, and it says, What can I do to cheer a world of sorrow? How bring back hope when men have sorely failed? Just where I am, I'll speak the word of comfort. Tell how for me Christ sacrificed a veil. Just where he needs me, just where he needs you, the Lord has placed you. Maybe not to go and do great development work here, there and everywhere, but where you are, just like Catherine, just where he's placed you on that day, at that time, be who you need to be for the other people that are around you. Do what you need to do for those who I need. We're going to, I'm going to invite you to stand and we're going to sing this song together. It's our final song this morning. As we think about all these things, as we think about God's world and all that, that um, we've been um, challenged about this morning as we've heard. We're going to sing it together as our final song. What can I say? And then the song goes on to say, what can I do? Actually, it says, what can I do? Three times. What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And it finishes with, what can I be? So let's rise together and we're going to sing this song to finalise our meeting.